Hi there, viewers and listeners. Welcome back to another movie review from 11 to 8. We are back on Bond tonight. We are talking about GoldenEye, 1995 release. And we've got the usual, Justin and Samir with us, but we've also got Henry back from the Bond Geek. Hey! Yeah, we invited him back because uh, GoldenEye, that was his, um, well, it's the first James Bond movie you ever watched, wasn't it? Yeah, it was the first James Bond film I saw at the age of four years old. Yeah. So we thought, you know, why not invite him on and uh, we'll just discuss it and take it from there. We discover that there is a crime syndicate that's kind of closely tied to splinter factions of the Russian government. I believe I'm getting that right. Um, there's a bit of agent, double agent and crossing, uh, double crossing going on in this movie as well. And we learn that uh, there is a, a, like a, a weapon that's floating around in space that can shoot down EMP pulses and completely take out electronics <clears throat> and stuff like that. So potentially could destroy the world. And obviously Bond's involved, in he? I mean, you know, he's sent off to go and sort it all out like he usually is and that. And uh, what kind of shenanigans happen? Cast, all right? Now, this is a big one, actually, the cast. I'm only going to do six, though, and you can look up the cast yourself. There's so many people in this, so many actors that could be mentioned. But Pierce Brosnan, this is his debut as Bond, so he comes in and replaces Timothy Dalton. Isabel Scropoco. I think that's how you pronounce that. I was going to say she Scrotum then. Scro <laughs> Isabella Scrotum. Yeah. <clears throat> she plays these sort of, uh, she plays like a Russian programmer in this, and she's kind of love love interest in, in this. You know, there's <clears> always <throat> one in a Bond film. Uh, Fanky Jensen. She plays a Russian uh, <clears throat> uh, assassin, I believe she is. Sean Bean plays Alec Trevelyan. Uh, actually, 006. Joe Don Baker makes a return. What movie was that he was in before? The Living Daylight. Daylight. Brad Whitaker. That's it. Thank you. Yeah, he makes a return and he plays a CIA agent called Jack Wade. And we have a debut of Judy Dench, who is the new M. Okay, well, that's the cast done. So usually about this time I hand over to Samir for some uh, dubious facts and um, <laughs> half-truths. So, Samir, what have you got? Number one, budget was 60 million. Number two, it made three hundred and fifty-six point four million in the at the box office. Bottom line, I think uh, you know my accountant set on my. I'll say well done to them. The shame thing was Tim Dalton actually wanted to return for this movie. The producers wanted him back, and because there was a, such a big gap, I think there was a five five year gap, uh, and six years till the movie would come out, and he wanted to do his third one which was going to be Lady of the Property. And yeah. what... Uh, other way yeah, around yeah. Property of a lady. Property of the lady, yep, sorry. Um, First correction. Yes. First correction, yes. <laughs> 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 so... That, that saves He's going to kill later. me by the end of this video after I keep going, <laughs> correction. <laughs> so basically, he said to... Uh, Chubby uh, Broccoli, as Justin calls him. Uh, Cubby Broccoli, that, okay, yeah, I'm happy to come back, do my one movie, and uh, goodbye. But he basically said, no, you need to do multiple ones. And um, he said, oh, do I have to? He goes, okay, I'll tell you what, I'll retire from this. Part oh, it's 007. And that's what happened. Uh, and that's why we got a new Bond. People don't realise Pierce Brosnan was always going to replace... <clears throat> Dalton anyway because he was already he had signed a contract for Living Daylight but Remington still had a clause and they uh, sort of uh, took advantage of that clause when those last three days of it left so he never got the part so essentially he had basically was able to take over and he was going to take over but at the same time they thought okay let's test other guys out so they went back to Mel Gibson which I do not get why in 95 they did, because by that time, I don't think Mel Gibson would have been a good Bond, personally. I think he it was a big too much... at the time. I mean, you must remember, like, yeah, was a mega was coming out. Um, I mean, yeah. still to this day, Mel Gibson, I think, is a really, really, actually really good actor when he's given his great material. I love him as a director, even, yes. you know, even so. So but I think, yeah, he was a big name at the time. Very big name, and I don't think the Bond uh, producer really could have paid him at the time because of the mm. way they wanted to restrict the budget on the Bond movie because it was a risk. Um, 
so but the other person they um also asked was he you grant i can't really imagine him saying bond james bond nah, without saying uh, a bond if it isn't too much trouble if you could possibly um you know uh, break break yourself away from your drink yeah. i'd like to introduce but yeah just that shit Absolutely. Just wouldn't work, yeah would you like yeah, two it wouldn't more work names? Would you like two more names if they aren't on your list? I've got, I've got, I've got another name. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. I, I missed out quite a few because there was, there was not, there was five or six actually. Liam Neeson was yeah. also uh, involved in, it. and the sad part is he wanted the part. He would have taken the part, but his wife, Natasha Richardson, said, "If you take the part, we're going to divorce. That's it. You're not going to play Bond. Simple as that." Fucking, that's a bit strong, isn't it? it sounds like you were there for that. No, he, he mentions <laughs> it. He, man, he mentions what? it quite a few. So she Sorry? she didn't want him to be away for so long because yeah, you know, that's right. Yeah, yeah, it does hurt a relationship when you're away for so long. They say and the stuff, and you know he basically chose love over bond, which is fair enough. What You've missed out. Well, I would, have, I, I would have chosen bond over love, mate, because being <laughs> bond is uh, lots. It means a big deal to me if they ever gave me the part. You've missed out. <laughs> You've missed out. Actually, important name who was. A contender for Bond. No, I, yeah, Sam Neill. Sam Neill was on. No, that game. was Living Daylights. No, but he was again uh, oh, no. considered in this, in a, a fact. But I don't know who else. These were the ones. Uh... Sean Bean. Yes, oh, Sean right. Bean. You're right. Yeah, he was. Yeah. He was. He was, but, the, uh... he was the backup if Brosnan said no. But they loved him so much, they decided to actually put him in the movie. Still, obviously, as the villain. <laughs> would have been interesting. I would have loved it. Another uh, hmm. another fact I've got, which is not really well online but do you remember there was a doctor who movie where paul mcgannon played yeah. the part yeah he was doctor actually who, yeah. the second yeah he was the second choice actually mm. so if peter Brosnan had said no he would have he had already signed a contract saying yeah i'll take over the part but you're right at the same time sean bean was mm. in there and i think it was between those two Number seven, John Wu turned down the chance to actually direct GoldenEye. He said, thanks, but no thanks. Uh, and I understand why he wanted to make it more rougher and tougher. And at the time, I don't think the Bond producers wanted to take that sort of risk. <laughs> the other amazing fact was the Rolling Stones was asked to actually write and sing the Bond song. And they said, nah, it's not for us. We're not that sort of, we're too cool for that. Not only there, they were coming back up. Yeah, it would have been quite interesting Rolling Stones doing it and comparing it to Live and Let Die because he had ex Beatle doing it, obviously, and then having the Rolling Stones doing it. It would have been that sort of contest between two legends from the 60s. But they said, no, we're too cool for this. And on the top, the one who screams every time she kills people, like she's having an orgy, and she is, she did her own stunts when, uh, doing the Ferrari scene, uh, <coughs> driving the Ferrari, and she did a, a, quite, a, quite a few of them. Another What's fact that I've not hold on, hold on, hold on, hold on, hold on. Let's, no, let's not leave that. Let's not let that one go. What do you mean their own stunts? The um, Funky Yasmin the... was like so into the film. <laughs> everyone was yeah. as everyone in the behind the scenes was talking about. We just got to go hell for leather. Just really go into it. So there's you know this scene in the bath, sort of touch bath where they're Bond mm. and Zena on top of fighting. Yeah. Literally, they both agreed. Let's just go at it both together. Yeah. So you she know, right rip. Yes. Yeah, got broke ribs while doing okay. Yeah, broke ribs. I was, I was specifically referring to the Ferrari bit. Mm. Yeah, she did the driving bit. as well. As right, well, she actually did this. Although yeah, she, she did... didn't towards the end because she smashed up the, the bit where she cuts the corner on the gravel. She yeah. actually spun it and the DB5 hit the Ferrari. They only had one yes. and one Ferrari. They had to work through the night to repair them to showroom condition mm. to carry on filming. And they said, you're yes. not getting back in it to finish this off. Yeah, another fact is, like, you know that scene where they end up on top of uh, Monaco? It's not, because their actual road is a famous uh, Winter Valley road in Italy, and it doesn't end up in Monaco at all. It doesn't show up. So that was actually, most of it was shot in Italy, and then the end, they just put the screen or whatever, green screen or CCG or whatever it's called, um, CIG or whatever it's called, uh, blue screen. CGI. There CGI. too. <laughs> CGI. What it's called. <laughs> every every version you know except what? the right one. You know what we've had? We had Lady of the Property. We've had yeah. IGC, <laughs> and then GCI. You know. So tell tell me something. What other facts do you know about O seven O? 
is 0, 7, 0. <laughs> 1, 2, 5, 4, 3, 6. That is his uh, Universal Exports phone number. Yeah. Okay, so in this movie, the director did not like smoking. So they gave Bond, Bond gave up smoking in this movie, which I think was wrong because it was anti smoking. Because Bond is a 70 year day smoker. Well, we said that in the last movie review. That was the last Bond where you see yeah. Bond yeah. smoking. Yeah, but, but, smoking at all. But I've got broccoli. Yeah, he smoked cigar, but not asked to go out. I mean, it's integral um, to his character that he has to smoke. I mean, it's a bit... Well, yes, because uh, Fleming wrote him as uh, a character that smoked. Why don't we say the amount of uh, shit he used to eat, the amount of drinks he mm. used to have, and the amount of smoking he did, Bond would have been dead by his <laughs> 45th birthday, right? He wouldn't have been jumping over fences or anything because he would have been just out of shape, out of breath every second. The tank scene took four weeks to shoot. That was one of the hardest things they had to do. And it was done in Austria, uh, Vienna, not in um, St. Petersburg, as you may think. Some of it was. Some of it, but majority was done hmm. there. Justin, for fuck's sake, well, do you have actually, to always come out? Yeah, because <laughs> actually the majority of it was actually filmed at Pinewood. Actually, if we're talking about yeah. the majority of that scene was built at Pinewood, but I'll come on to that. The great thing about this movie, it was the first movie that was completely not done based on uh, any Ian Fleming's uh, books. But it was named after two things. His house in Jamaica that he had built in '45, where he basically didn't have any money, but he came from an aristocratic uh, family who are in the banking business, Fleming Bank, Merchant Bank. So he got that money and built this beautiful place called Golden Eye with a private beach. And it's shown a few times in another movie, a TV movie called Goldeneye, the story of Ian Fleming, in, made in 87 with Charles Dance. Great movie. I remember watching that as a kid. And the other Seriously. reason why, and the other, uh, yeah, it's really good. The other reason is it was also named after Operation uh, that he actually worked on during the Second World War, which was named Goldeneye as well. So they are the two things that the movie was named after. <laughs> And that's did, all my facts. Did you say that this is the first Bond film not based on any of Ian Fleming's literate? Sorry, what was your fact about that? Because I was just, I just want to check, fact check that one. Mm. So this is what I found out. It was the yeah. first movie where it was completely not based on Ian Fleming's. Although there was one thing they're saying that was actually, they contradicted that in the facts as well, where it was going to be a... Um, property of the lady bit in it as well, but most of it was used and it was... Goldfinger. So I don't know well, no, my, my, what effects are right. I was going to say for that, this is sorry, just me being bong. Obviously, The Spy Who Loved Me, the film, um, they were allowed to use the title, but Fleming made it very clear that no one was allowed to use anything else from the novel. Now, I don't know if you guys read the novel. The novel's completely different. I mean, literally a complete 180. So I, for that fact, just, just me, just me being me, Pure fact, mm. I'd say Spy Who Loved Me was probably the first film that was completely original. Yeah. But I get where you come. I get where that fact is coming from because technically Spy Who Loved yeah. Me is still the name of a Bond book at where there's Golden Eyes. Okay. That's just me being thing. Why? Yeah, um... I know what you're saying because uh, the books are completely different. It's like You Only Live Twice, and all of them are completely different to movies in most fa- most bits. Mm. You mentioned the spy who loved me then, it like being a complete 180. Why was that? What, well, the spy loved did... me. This um, the book is separated into three parts. It follows first off a lady who is um, tra- trailing sort of documents. Bond doesn't come into like the second third of the novel, um, and it's just more about her journey through it. Um, and it's all about Bond, you know, having a night with her. And this, hence, the spy who loved me. Um, mm-hmm. It's not really the spy loved me novel is not really actually about Bond at all. In the novel, there's no like. There is a mention. There is a mention in the novel about a man with metal teeth, the inspiration mm-hmm. for Jaws. But there's no yeah. like strong mm-hmm. burglar Paris. Um, there's no like um, connection with the there. I mean, it is a complete 180. And to be honest, it's probably one of Fleming's. It's not one of Fleming's weakest books or stories by any stretch. It's a good like read, but um, you know, if you read it, you'd go no way. You know, you can understand mm-hmm. he, you'd not turn any of that into a movie. All right, well, uh, thanks for that, Samir. Thanks for the facts, some good talking points.
Right, the first thing I should say about this film is that the time you've watched it in like the keen eye that I tend to, and then depending on where you read and where you research, there are well over a hundred continuity errors and mistakes. I, I'm not going to do every one of them because that would just be me reading it. So oh, I'm literally... Not, uh... No, oh, 101 no, of them. Oh, no, no, I'm not going to count down 101. <laughs> Maybe for another video. Maybe we'll do another video. But I, I think just the... I, I'm just going to stick to the obvious one. So the tank scene, I only want to mention tank scene because that was a, a really big thing. Um, whether it... I mean, it's, it, there's arguments how long it took to film, but let's just say it was the one of the longest filmed, prepared, pre-prepared sequences of any Bond so far because... The Russians wouldn't let them drive a tank around St. Petersburg. So what they did was that they built a huge set at the back of the 007 stage in, in Pinewood. They built effectively uh, a number of streets uh, of St. Petersburg. So they could ram the tank through the walls and do whatever they wanted to do without causing problems. So hence why, if you look very carefully, a lot of the background cars are always the same. Um Perrier Water paid an absolute fortune mm. to provide the truck with the cans, uh, but they were absolutely adamant uh, that they wanted to uh, collect everything up so they couldn't be sold for profit later or be claimed um, like um, props or whatever the case may be. Um, but the tank was very real. All of the cars were, were very real. The crushing was all very real. Um, but obviously the continuity is when you break for a wall, the bricks are on it, the bricks disappear. Um there was no way that he would have got into that tank and, and got it started in that space of time and then know how to drive it and then load it and fire it. it that was all a bit <laughs> rubbish. But of course, it's a film and it's an action film. So you, you've let all that go. Um, but the very the very opening sequence with the dam, it was a real shame. And I remember this when I very first watched it. And it was a shame that I got reminded of it this time that even at the very first moment, you know it's not Bond, it's a stunt man. Um, his hair's all too bouffant, um, etc. But the point with that dam thing, in my mind, is completely irrelevant because he goes down the dam and at the very end when he comes out, he's coming out like on top of a mountain on a runway. But yet he's gone down many hundreds of feet on a dam. So, And at no point did you see him climbing hundreds of feet back up to a mountain to go on a runway to jump off to go and get a plane. So the, the geography was all wrong. Of that, of that opening sequence. Uh, and as he flies away with the plane, because they built a huge set um, and it was a remote control plane or CGI, whatever, all the people running up the runway with the motorbikes had all gone in the scene as he flies away and then you get the opening sequence. It's really hard to remember that. A bit like, in, you know how in Spy Love Me, the jump off the, the cliff was like a metaphor, if you will, for like Cobby Broccoli just jumping out into the abyss and going at it alone. Yeah. This is like, if you will, a jump going into, you know, this is the next generation of broccoli and stuff, taking it over and can Bond survive? Okay, I suppose I hadn't really looked at it like that. Like, yeah, I mean, pretty you know, deep thinking though. That, that is quite deep thinking. I'm not going to lie. deeper than I would the commentary think, is, it has, they did say that a bit in the commentary and they wanted a stunt that was really quite a jaw dropping right yeah, at the okay. beginning. And that's why they did it. And to be honest, you know, when I first saw it, and we'll get into it later, it was quite a visual thing for me to watch. But, you know, you are right with the geography about that. Well, and also, if you if you think about that jump with the, and the dam is actually on the camera. So the dam is sort of is, is arcing out, isn't it? Yeah. So, and for the fact, that it would have to be a bungee cord that he's using. When that thing snapped, it would have thrown him straight into the fucking dam anyway. It would have... Snap thing, yeah. and it would, and it would have gone. But it's smack. A, about ten thousand people since the move have actually jumped from that spot. Oh yeah, so it's the track with or without the, yeah. the attachments. With the attachments, I hope so. Anyway, yeah, it's, a, it's a popular suicide Ooh. point. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Piers Brosnan also. I don't know whether it's because he just wanted to sort of look a bit heroic after Timothy Dalton mm -hmm. had, had done so many of his own stunts that Piers Brosnan wanted to do the same. Um, but it was very true in this instance as well that Piers Brosnan wanted to do as much as he was physically allowed or was he physically able. Um, and, you know, there was other members of the crew, uh, like on a top, that wanted to do that, um, which is always fine until things go wrong. And, and smashing up cars and then when you're trying to shoot a film and then have to spend all that money repairing them um, is, is kind of brings an end to that. But the thing with that Ferrari 
uh, was that all the time it was racing, it was a red Ferrari with a beige interior. After the scene in the casino uh, where she drives off, uh, when he turns up and he goes, sort of looks and thinks, oh, that's the same Ferrari, uh, it's a black interior. Um, mm hmm when the uh, when they're in the helicopter and he headbutts the um, the switch and they eject, uh, you can clearly see it's two massive white parachutes that come out. But as it comes down and it falls to the ground, they're red and white parachutes. And similarly, in the plane that they fly over the pond when it gets shot down, um, it's a white and maroon when he gives takes it off the CIA guy. But as it's crashing, it's a white and red. And you can't that is so quick that you can't tell the call sign on the back. But it certainly looks like the call sign is different. So I just think getting now getting to that point, I think those sort of things shouldn't be coming in errors anymore. I expect as these films draw on that we don't continue to see those, those sorts of errors is all I can, is all I can say. And the one probably that bugs me the most about this film, and I don't know whether any of you noticed this or Henry might agree with me on this, but at the very end, when he lands in the field and matey boy appears and he goes, and he signals the Marines. Where the fuck did those helicopters come from? Yes. And you would have heard them. Oh, yes. No, it's just yeah. like, yes. and, and did they hear his whistle? And go, and suddenly it's like, what? I let that one thing... go. I let that one go just for the sort of fun ending. You know what I mean? Just one of those fun sort of, you know, just no. oh, that's a bit of a laugh at the end of the movie. No, but sorry, that is typical bloody Americans. Let the British finish off the job and we'll turn up. Come I, on. It was it was ridiculous. Yeah, well, but this is the thing uh, that really annoyed me. In real life, if you've got so many troops or commandos, you're not going to wait for a double O agent or a secret service agent to finish off the job, try to make love to a woman and then go, hi, guys, there's thousands of 500 of us here who could have helped you out. Come but on. Fun fact, when they, they, when the they jumped department. out the helicopter, you should, you should yeah. have heard like a... <laughs> You know, because how did I know not like, jumping on one of these dudes in a ghillie suit? Mm. Oh, you probably did, and the guy's just going, <laughs> that makes a sound. Fucking right in my bollocks. Oh my bad. god, they're actually doing it right on top of me. Should I move? Should I not move? <laughs> oh, what's that? Oh, mm. oh, oh. oh hello. <laughs> Is it wrong that I'm getting a stiffy from this? <laughs> <laughs> Not yeah. good. Yes. And also the, the missile that they fired out of the thing to that plane. When that, all that was drained, oh, the water, that, yeah. yeah, was there there wasn't a guy with a little bazooka underneath that was under where the fuck did that come from? From the base. There was a base right. underneath oh, the satellite. It was a huge dish. Yeah, but, yeah, but underneath there. the Yeah. The, the, the biggest problem I had with that with the missile was it didn't blow that plane to pieces. My biggest complaint is it didn't blow up the bloody BMW. <laughs> Oi, steady on. Trust me, it, you're going to kill me when I get to be that BMW. It's also noted factually as well, in the German version of this, you don't see 006 shot at the beginning. You only see him die at the end, and then they cut the bit falling on him completely. I don't know why in the German version they did that. but And really, to be honest, I, I could go on and on with counting down on on these but i think i just wanted to cover the main ones that may mm -hmm. be the topic we might cover a few more on the final thoughts uh in all of that oh the only right. thing i did want to say was about the space bit did they just borrow that from moonraker no no because we've moved on quite a few years from moonraker i'm sure we established that the planet isn't blue quite like that and i'm sure we could have done something better with a prop that i think looked like or was borrowed from Moonraker. I'm sure there was something that fired a laser that looked exactly like that. Look at the no, price. At least it wasn't Dynam Diamonds Are Forever bad. Well, no. no, but I think they could have done I think they could have done better. We've been in space quite a few times come 95. I think we could have done they could have CGI'd actually a proper looking planet. Everyone keeps mentioning Final Force. Let's get on. Let's oh, I've got to on. talk about my personal history here, but I've got to talk about it for you guys, just for your entertainment value. Right. I'll just crack open all this then. heavy personality. <laughs> but guys, um, Golden Eyes to say this. As you mentioned at the beginning, this was the my very first Bond film. I saw it at four years old. Actually, 
my mum rented this film for my older brother, who's three years older than me. We actually rented two Martin Campbell movies that year. That's on that, that day. We rented Goldeneye and The Mask of Zorro. So I saw them both over the same weekend. Great weekend, mm. by the way. Um, and I always remember my mum literally let me watch Goldeneye with my brother saying, she said, right, this is a story about a secret agent who saves the world. His name is James Bond. You might enjoy this. My mum was thinking four years old, this is just going to go over my head. Pre-credit sequence was just literally blew my mind. So yeah, that, that was like, utterly like you know was around. i mean to my day my parents actually still this day go why did we rent goldeneye from blockbuster why did we rent goldeneye from blockbuster <laughs> after all the times i've annoyed them over the years about bond um but the one i know you are all gonna love is obviously being four years old you don't really know much about the world do you mm, so for instance i didn't know what sex was okay, okay. Um, it wasn't those times, everybody, if you're a younger audience member, the internet wasn't really around much. So the very first sex scene I ever saw ever in my life was Xena on the top, killing that admiral guy in that bed with that whole, ah, oh, me, 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 and like the looking like, and literally I, I didn't know what the hell I was watching. And literally my mum remembers this to this day. I literally, four year old me just looked, turned to mum and said, mummy, what are they doing? <laughs> she looked like, what the hell do I say? So she just said, shut up and watch the film. <laughs> but That's a good out, that is. Just uh, ignore it not... completely. I won't worry, mate. Smear's 44 and he messaged me earlier asking the same thing. <laughs> <laughs> no, that was me. I know oh, that. Because no one has sex like that. No one has no. sex like that. No. Oh, In the wait, wait, senor, I can't breathe. <laughs> you know what? Goldeneye is one of those important like moments in the Bond franchise. I say the same like when Roger Moore took over that allowed the series to continue going forward. Um, you know, in a, you know when they finally cast you know Sean Connery because obviously we've mentioned this earlier. The Cold War ended in between License to Kill mm -hmm. and Goldeneye. There was a lot of discussion like is Bond now irrelevant? You know, this was the film that was going to hopefully show that you no know, Bond can carry on going. So it's a very important master. Obviously. Avatar Broccoli retired and got Barbara, who'd been working on the film since Moonraker to a degree. You know, she became a producer now, finally, carrying it on. His words of wisdom was always go back to Fleming. It's all there in the world, in the books. Just always go back to Fleming if you're stuck. And to this day, she's actually still done that in some form or whatever. Um, one thing I love about Pierce Brosnan, obviously, and let's just let's just get this away. Brosnan was my childhood Bond, okay? You know, it's very clear now. He is my favourite. He's the one I grew up with. So I think there's an, under an understandable sort of bias. Mm -hmm. But obviously, yeah. Dalton really wanted to get into more like, you know, he's not a Superman. He's very much a human character. And Brosnan did want to continue that. And to a degree, if you look at his first two, well, actually the first three films he did, he did try and continue that in a different way. So when everyone talks about Daniel Craig being the more human Bond, if you will, it really did start with Dalton. It got carried on in a different way by Brosnan and then carried on again to Daniel mm. Craig. Because if you look into oh, this film, that. one of my favourite moments of this film is for me, there's a bit like after the BMW driven, and you know they're on the beach just before the big finale. And yeah. Natalia, the girl, huh. goes to, like Bond says, you know, he was your friend, yes. Now he's your enemy, and now you're oh, going to no. kill him. He goes, just yes. He goes, how can you do that? How can you be so cold? How can you look at that? And he just says simply, "It's what keeps me alive." It's a that sort of insight to me that is just so Bond. It's that mental state he has to be in that Brosnan showed, I think, so well in his performance. Certainly, the first three films. You know, I'm obviously referencing Die Another Day, which was a complete misstep. But he did so many other things again, like in Twenty of Dies, and there wasn't enough trying to show that different side of Bond. It's another See, reason why point, I just really liked him. At that point of the beach scene there, where she's yeah. having a go at him, I thought, "Fucking shut up! You only known him five minutes." Gold and I, as well, just from another side of things. Obviously, again, kid of the nineties, it was a massive milestone when it came to pop culture and media. You know, everyone talked to my generation about Gold and I. You know, it was a massive thing. And then you, you, we were talking about earlier, the game. We've got to talk about the game here. The Gold 9 Nintendo 64 game was one of the most influential, great, you know, you just it stand the test. I mean, to this day, 
like I'm, not, I'm just trying to show you with my hand i can imagine holding a nintendo 64 controller i know like going through that game okay i could do this blindfolded a lot of dalton's potential third bond film was sort of modified and drafted into goldeneye if i can just give some examples um, as we discussed earlier the pre-tire sequence was going to be set in scotland there was going to be a massive explosion in a robotics factory because the property of a lady was going to deal a lot with the robotics industry there was a sense of a bit of like a Bond versus robots, but not like Terminator robots or anything like that. There was going to be a sort of Bond versus sort of slight, you know, machinery robots. There was also going to be, it was also going to be very heavily set in China. You know, there was potentially going to be a ski chase in Northern China. There was going to be potentially a motorcycle chase sequence along the Great Wall of China. And what you were going to get introduced in The Property of Lady was this actor called Den Holcrisp was going to be played by sir anthony hopkins who was meant to be bond's mentor turned villain but that got obviously turned into his best friend alec trevelyan for goldeneye yeah right. um that was gonna happen you're also the main bond leading lady character i can't remember the name just off the top of my head but essentially what it was going to be was if you will be a batwoman catwoman sort of relationship she was going to be a professional thief and there was going to be that sort of if Bat- batman is bond then this is going to be catwoman essentially and they would have gone through the film together but it was essentially going to be a bit of Bond v. Robots. She just reminded well. me, on the top just reminded me of that, the girl in um, Connery's non-Bond, uh, Never Say Never Again. Yeah, oh, Fatima uh, Blush. I'm, yeah, Fatima Blush. And I think I mentioned it during that film about mm. her later when we do this review. And it also reminded me of, um, uh, what's his face, uh, in View to a Kill um with the in the mine with the machine gun and him laughing as he's murdered oh, yeah. down christopher walken Where's, yeah christopher walken yeah walking yeah and he's, it, she's there she's like uh, uh, like it's like some really sadistic sort of like getting massive pleasure out of it and it's very yeah. strange well, that was deliberately done that way yeah I'm well, sure lady, i think it would have been an interesting film that's that I'm sure about. What do you, you know, first from what I've said, what do, what's your, your reactions to this potential property of a lady film that could have been? I don't know much about it. I, I haven't really read much about it. It's hard for me to get optimistic about things like that because I know how that, you know, the bonds have played out so far and they just don't really do it, do much for me. So it sounds intriguing, but I know if it come to reality, it'd be another bond film. I'd just go, Oh yeah, it was all right. Well, you know what? I've, I've been saying this to a couple of people like in the um, Bond community online. Um, I'm sure you've heard that Amazon are buying Metro Gold and Mare MGM. Yeah. Yeah. I know. I think if they do do that, we were, we were saying one of the things we'd love to see is an animated version of the Property of Lady, bring Timothy Dalton back and maybe just see, like, make an animated version of this unmade Bond film that what could have been. It's an interesting twist to what other options they might have. Hmm. Well, I, I personally think, Henry, is that there was a big opportunity missed because, to me, Dalton was just certain in, and, you know, I think his third movie would have made him as Bond. Yeah. He never got the chance to be, like, everyone underestimates him, underrates him as Bond quite a lot of people. Yeah, but, did, but wasn't it his people... decision? Wasn't it his decision not to it was his decision. half and half? He was, yeah, mm. it was, yeah, I would say 50 50, like uh, Andrew says. I think if it was done in 91, he would have carried on. And I think Goldeneye would have been his uh, last one, maybe. Um, it would have been his fourth and last one. Uh, but he would have gone out with a big bang. People would have accepted him, saying, oh, he was good Bond, blah, blah. And they would have still been talking about him. Mm-hmm. But now, every time we talk about Bond, they talk about Tim Dalton, and they say, hmm, we're not sure. Dalton was ahead of his time. time. I liked him as Bond, yeah. Um, you know, he is, again, he's like my second favourite James Bond, if I'm honest. You know, he beats um, Sean Connery for me. I know that might sound heresy to some people, mm. but, you know, it's just, you know, just the way it is. I mean, Licence Kill, I mean, I know it wasn't there for your review, but, I, you know, literally as soon as it came up on YouTube, I literally instantly started watching because I was loving to hear what you guys all said about Licence to Kill. I mean, that film, I remember, scared the crap out of me as a kid, but has one of the best villains I think of the whole series of all time in that film. Before we move on with that, and you mentioned Amazon have bought MGM and all that kind of stuff now. Um, to the Bond fans out there, Amazon brought you the reimagined Cinderella. That's all I'm saying. Yeah. <laughs> I know what you. I know what you're thinking, but I'm not going to comment on it. Yeah. Well, and also, and also, it's going to be in Black Adam this year, so that will make up for it. 
Yeah, <laughs> and also didn't Disney, you know, start take over, you know, Star Wars? Look what happened there and all. <laughs> mm. Yes. Everybody, listen. <laughs> Everyone is entitled to their own opinion. You know, this is a free world. My opinion is my own. But the one big, big issue with the Brosnan era I have, more than kite surfing as <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I know. Sorry, just every time surfing a tsunami. <laughs> I'm sorry. The one issue I have is the bloody BMWs, the bane of Bond's car history. They look disgusting beyond belief. They are, and I know I, I'm insulting my fiance here, but they're hairdressers' cars. They're not cool, suave, sophisticated cars. BMWs are literally people who drive and saying, I am a man with less than one inch between my legs. You know, I've that had about as many BMWs. BMWs tells people. I've had about as many BMWs sorry, as your BMW age, said, <laughs> <laughs> the BMW Z3 in God's Eye is dreadful. Q has this great scene where this it says, behind the headlights, Stinger missiles. We don't even see it. We don't even see it. It's useless in the but, film. But that is, but that is but actually something only... quite common with the BMWs. I agree with you. They don't show no Stinger missiles. Z3. That's the, that's the three litre Z3 that they feature in that film. Um, but they don't show it very much. And of course, similarly in the next film or the one after, you see the, the very iconic concept, um, Z8. Z8. Um, which I was just going to say. Immediately gets cut in half, which I will is a admit, bit of a shame. But of I course, mean, you see the, the 750. Yeah. I will admit this. The BMW in World's Not Enough, out of all the BMWs, so, is the best looking. The that car is super sexy. But actually, I'm it not, wasn't the 750. Yeah. It was a 740 with a 750 IL badge on the back. But anyway, we'll, we'll gloss yeah, over that I, one. I, I agree with Henry. The Z8 was the best looking uh, BMW. Uh, he wasn't a bloody executive, was he? Going, uh, I'm going to go to my office and my secretary is going to make me a coffee in a bit. Uh, and I'll drive my BMW up to uh, my office in central London. He was a spy. He's, he don't drive BMWs as a spy. I, I, I will admit, I will admit the, Z, the Z3 <laughs> is, a bit of a, is a bit of a hairdresser's car. They, which is why they launched the Z4. Hold on, you're in hairdressers, mate. Keep on saying no, hairdresser, hairdressers. No, they are yeah. hairdressers' cars. In the same way as Audi TTs are hairdressers' cars. Mate, for somebody yeah. who's owned more BMWs and Audis than than most people, right, I, I, I'm, I'm an authority on this one, right? And I've got the That's Z4. That's what he says. The Z4 is not so much a hairdressers' car because they launched it purposely not to have that but i will tell you something about the z4 is most of them that i see are driven by old men with glasses yeah i'll I'll tell you something else something else that's affected the zeitgeist of my generation okay when it comes to my section if you will you know the exploding pen you know the free clicks to this day i know from my generation if you have one of those pens and I do it at work. People notice I do it at work. I'm literally just working and they go one, two, one, two, three, one, two, three. Can anyone tell me why there was a, a DB5 at the beginning of this film? And then we switched well, that was because it was uh, to uh, tell, tell people Bond's back. It was like, okay, he's been away. He was away for five years or six years off screen. And that's why it's saying, you know, they were trying to get a connection between this and Goldfinger that this is the same person, same character. But he's been away for so long. That's it. Okay. That was one of the reasons. So why BMW then? Because they paid the money. BMW to, signed um, a multi-million pound uh, contract deal. Uh, I mean, technically, them. if you want to talk about that, here's a fact for you. You know, obviously, the pre-tile sequence in Goldeneye set nine years before the actual events of the movie. Yeah. Technically, that happens before the Living Daylights. Yeah. Yes. True, actually. It does. Yeah. Uh, right. Okay. So generally, I mean, Pierce Brosnan as Bond, I mean, obviously we know where you stand with this, Henry, but everyone else? Uh, I, I'm, I've said this a long time ago. Um, uh, Pierce Brosnan for me was when I started to really get into Bond. So it's the first Bonds that I watched was Pierce Brosnan Bond. I got into the, you know, watched the previous ones after. Paul, you and I started a marathon years ago uh, on, on the Bond films, but only got so far until life changes took mm. place um and uh i i think i think brosnan's presence i think uh, we haven't talked about robbie coltrane um either uh yet and and i think i just like piers brosnan's presence i i love the bit and i've got to stand up to do this bit i love the bit on the yacht where, he, where he's on that yacht and he gets that oh, door yeah. and he goes 
with a door. It's like he gets a proper stance and pulls it. It's like an Ace Ventura. Oh, 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 <laughs> You're a wizard, James. Yeah. <laughs> it, um, but his whole presence, you know, where he's in that uh, grave, you know, in the sort of, you know, the Soviet graveyard, and he hears that noise, and, and he just, he very, he comes, he sort of jockeys and pulls the gun out, sort of, and, you know, with his back arched, like an, like an archery. And it was like his presence, I don't know, I just, I like his presence on screen. I think he's a great reinvention of Bond. Mm. He modernised it very well for yeah. the time. Yeah. God, I'm, all, I'm out of breath now, I've done that door thing, getting old. Fucking Samir, what do you reckon on Piers Brosnan? Okay. I'm going to say he, he did well done to him because he revived. Because if Golden Eye had flopped, Daniel Craig would have never played Bond because that would have been it. So I'm going to say well done for that. But after going and watching the movies again, to me overall, it's just... He, nah, he's okay. He's not brilliant. I, 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 I don't know. There's too much... The, it's bec- Bond is becoming soft in his movies. I personally think it was like dull. And I, as I said in the last movie, I became a big fan after watching, doing reviews of the Dalton movies. And when you change it to him, Pierce Brosnan, you can tell there's a completely different way of doing it. It's more softer. Yeah, he doesn't gentle, have a duck on his and, head. No, but neither does. Uh, no, so he's got. He's, no, Dalton. I think you've got a valid point. I think you've got a valid point because Brosnan very much was going in a different direction. He was trying to be. Yeah. He was trying to be more human as Bond, but he was trying to, at the same time, because the franchise show would be, if you will, like an amalgamation of all the previous Bonds put together. So he tried yes. to do some Connery. He tried to put in some more into it as well. So I think when you say he's gone softer, that does yeah. make sense because I think, obviously, again, let's look back. Remember, like Living Dallas and Licensed Kill weren't, should we say, the most well-received No, at the time. You know, okay, this isn't working. Go back to this. Well, what I have to say, Henry, uh, and I've told the the other guys that uh, before we did the reviews of Dalton's movies, he was he was my least favourite. But after watching that, I wish he had done more movies. Mm. It's because Pierce Brosnan, I think, went too soft and Die Another Day, his last one, mucked up his legacy as well. He wasn't he as bad. He, he, deserves a, he deserved a better ending. He deserved one more movie because of that as well. Um, and People compare him to Daniel Craig and say, oh, Craig's 100 times better. But they have to realise, although he's not my favourite Bond, it was him with Goldeneye that helped him do these movies. Otherwise, if Goldeneye had flopped and he had yeah. flopped, that's it. The studios would have said, goodbye, James Bond. It's over. So in that sense, yeah, I'm in the middle uh, with Brosnan. He's not the best, but he's not the worst. That goes to, unfortunately, Sir Roger. So I'm going to be on the fence on him. I'll be uh, frank and honest. Oh, frank and honest is it. Frank and honest making yep. an entrance. God, oh, yeah. every yeah. week he eventually gets cool. there. Yeah, <laughs> right. Um, mine's very, very simple, actually, with Pierce Brosnan. As soon as he was hanging upside down in that bog, that toilet cubicle, and says, sorry, I forgot to knock, I thought, Roger Moore 2.0. Fuck this guy. Yeah. And the quips, the one-liners in this film, I just like... Oh, God, this is like Roger Moore again. No, I don't like it. You've gone from Timothy Dalton that was playing it kind of serious and a bit aggressive in parts and stuff, and very straight, to hanging upside down in a toilet cubicle. Sorry, I forgot to knock. No, no. Don't like it. <laughs> don't fucking like it. It's, sorry, it's just lines you know from the light, guys. I've got, I've got a big note in my notes in front of me that just says smug cunt exclamation mark. Because it was, it was like, again... You know, doing everything with yeah. a little sort of smile at the end, and I thought, oh god, here we go. I think it was also like that that one he did, didn't he? he said, "Oh, shut the door. There's a draft." You know, it's like you felt yeah. like there was somebody there that he really worked with and trusted. But I don't know. I, I, that was one of the I, I worst times for me. Again, I get where Paul's coming from because, as I say, he was trying mm. to sort of carry on that bit of Roger Moore, and I think they were hoping that how he could be so badass in the action sequences of it that it would counterbalance it. Now, for me, it worked. Mm. Obviously, for Paul, did not. Fair enough. But as you say, smug, that word. Um, <laughs> See, the problem you know, is... Bond Henry, was I know a what you... smug, that word, in the store, yeah. in the books. Um, he was. But, no, I, I really do get where you're coming from, because you're not alone. I, I have 
um, a friend at work, who, you know, he likes he likes Bond, not to not to my so we say, you know, anorak of geekness. But, you know, so and he said level. the thing I couldn't stand with with Pierce Brosnan was I just felt at times he was trying to play it one way and then he was trying to play it another. Now I don't know mm. if it was the scripts that he was given, but they could never decide properly, fully which direction he was going to go. Yeah. And I think that's perfect explained in what you just said. Well, there's a scene where he was in that prison cell with the uh, the woman, uh, Natasha, Natalia, whatever. And he was really forceful with her about tell me what you know, and I might be able to help you. And I thought, okay, I like that direction. It's kind of, I guess I just like the sort of the serious side of Bond rather than this stupid mm. little jocular kind of character that Roger Moore was. And it just, it, it takes it, I, I lose, um, what's the word? Very similitude. I'm, not, I, I'm just not invested in it. You know, it, it breaks the immersion for me. That's what I was looking for. Immersion breaking, these stupid little things, because you just wouldn't. If you used to kill mm. someone mm. or push someone over the edge of a cliff or something, you'd go, oh, enjoy your trip. Uh, you're just not, I uh Send us a postcard. <laughs> yes. Yeah, just... He did do that a bit in the novels, because Bond always had a very dark wit. Sometimes when he killed someone, yeah, but very, it was very, very, yeah, very rare. Yeah, I just don't the like thing it. Is like, yeah, so, <laughs> this is what he did. So end, I'm, I'm not trying you? to, I'm not trying to defend, like, say, no, you're wrong. Sincerely, oh, no, with yeah. all my heart, I'm not trying to do that. No, no, no I'm right. It's just my head. <laughs> <laughs> but he did, he did that well, no, at the no, end Henry. when he when he let him go. He said no for me, and he let him go. That was a very dark mm. side of Bond, wasn't it? He said, "Oh, for England, but James." He went no for me, and then let him go. But if Bond was played the way that I would like it to be played, these these films would be eighteen rated. They wouldn't yeah. be PG thirteen. So that's Definitely. yeah, that's why. It, yeah, yeah. I, I just prefer yeah. the more serious sort of movies. On a lighter note, can I just ask a question? Yeah. Is what is it with Russians in these films in massive rooms with little, yeah. no soft furnishings <laughs> and no cases that... plugging anything in? <laughs> yeah, you just got that table in the middle of that massive room. <laughs> well, Again, don't forget at the time. Don't forget at the time uh, the Soviet Union had collapsed. It'd been only a few years. There was loads of corruption, and There's the country no was bankrupt. And yeah, yep, and there was no IKEA, and um, Russia was in it on its knees. And that's why this story was about how actually even the defense minister could get killed by a general, and he would get away with it. That wouldn't have happened in the oh, Soviet Baptiste. times. Oh, Baptiste! We need to mention Baptiste. Yeah, Baptiste. Yeah, yeah, Baptiste. yeah, brilliant. Wait, bad Baptiste. boys. Brilliant 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 yeah. yeah, bad boys, yeah. Great actor, yeah. great actor. Brilliant actor, yeah. I love him. Should we score this then? Who wants to go first then? Oh, I think we should let guests go first. All right, guys, um, look, there's no surprise <laughs> here, but, you know, even Paul <laughs> knows it's coming. But <laughs> GoldenEye receives a full solid 10 out of 10 for me. Apart from, I think it is, I think it is a great spy film, a great actor sequences, and great characters. Goldeneye is the film that not only got me into James Bond, but got me into loving movies as a whole. So when you've got a film that's that important to you, that how much yeah. of an emotional connection, you can't give it anything else but a ten. Now I fully accept Goldeneye is, in that sense, it can never be beaten. In one sense, Skyfall came close for me, you know, into potentially beating Goldeneye, but. For those reasons, you know, again, Goldeneye got me into loving films, Bond, introduction to Blockbuster, into video games, help me get into video games as well. You know, I think it's understandable this time, very much it's a solid 10 out of 10 for me. Fair play, fair enough. Mm, okay. Cool. Um, I'll, yeah, I'll go next. Um, in, in some ways, same as, as Henry, uh, for similar reasons. Um, I'm giving it a, an eight. Uh, for all its faults, it, it for me it was the start of my getting really keen into Bond. Of course, I knew who Bond was and Bond movies through parents and all the rest of it, but it was the first one really that I that I got into. And ninety five was quite a pinnacle year, leaving school, starting college, as Samir alluded to, meeting you guys, and I can and the N sixty four game, Goldeneye. Um, I, I I just enjoyed playing. I didn't have that sort of thing. Paul was my go-to, but I, he had all this stuff. I didn't. I wasn't allowed it. I was very different upbringing. And it was one of the first games I can remember. More than... Yeah, really <laughs> really getting into and 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 playing. I, 
and, and that, that game for me, I, and I, I, this is how sad, right? Last night I spent an hour. Yes, that's right, an hour. Okay, watching a YouTube video of the N sixty four game. Um, walk somebody playing it and walking through it, and I still remembered every detail. Do you, you looking forward to the remaster coming? I, I mean, I don't play computer games. I, 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 don't, I simply don't have time for it anymore. Mm. But if I were going to play a computer game and I could play N, and I could play Goldeneye, I probably would find the time to play that game. Mm. So my score right, is a six. This film was just... That's not bad for you. Yeah, it's all right. It's, it's not awful. It's, it's all right. I like the tanks and... <clears throat> I thought that was pretty good. I like the way that the tank's going around corners and the back end of it is somehow sliding. I was like, how the fuck do they do that with a tank? <laughs> I thought that was pretty impressive. Um, but I don't have any real emotional attachment to this film. Just It's all right. It's all right. That's it? Okay. Now, guys. Fucking minus four. Right. No, you're not going to be minus or anything like that. It's going to be uh, a five, but I'll tell you why. To me, this was the beginning of the end for me for Bond in the sense of really, really thinking it was a Bond. It became more of an action uh, sort of thing. The Cold War was over. So I think the movies, this movie specifically, to me, didn't make, it was boring, basically, to me, at pace, places. And I always said that even when I first watched it, I thought, oh, my God, this is not Bond. What's going on? And it's just Pierce Brosnan. Sorry, guys, but after we've had Daniel Craig and Pierce Brosnan, you know, the two guys looked at Pierce and said, nah, he's too soft. He's trying to mix things up. I would have liked him to be more rougher and tougher. And I wish Tim Dalton actually was still born at that point. I don't know if I'm being sentimental because to me, the last era of Born, which was a lot of fun for me personally, was in the 80s, up to 89. I really, really enjoyed it. And there was a meaning to it as well for me, to James Bond. It was related to world events up to a point as well where, yeah, you were fighting the Soviets. There was a Cold War. Uh, the drug things happened during the 89-90 in the George Bush Senior's presidency where they went to parts of Central America and South America and got rid of some leaders who were involved in it and Pablo Escobar was getting sorted out that down there with this this was like showing what had happened to russia but at the same time a story which in my opinion was relevant but wasn't uh, so what you're saying is you would have liked it if the cold war had continued no i'm not saying that <laughs> i'm not saying that i'm not saying that yeah. i'm not saying that yeah uh, it might so have it, anyway. it would have been more interesting if it had carried on and hadn't collapsed. What? So what was more significant? <laughs> the end of Bond or the end of the Cold War? Yeah. No, yeah. I might be wrong on this, but I think I know where Samir is coming from, is yeah. the fact that this movie was not really based on anything, really. It was just kind of yeah. this That's what... sort of contrived story for the sake of having a story. It wasn't, you know... East and West well, it, and all that. So. Indeed, even to the point yeah. where, of course, uh, yeah, Valentin I, that's Fus what I'm sorry. Fukovsky, uh, 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 Robbie Coltrane was an ex KGB agent gone, uh, opening his, you know, launching his own faction, if you like. And of course, you see him later on, uh, almost sort of becoming friends with with Bond. So, <clears throat> yeah, because it's all broken down, these people are off doing different things, and you got splinter cells, if you like, you know, going mm. off and, you know, almost, um, it's almost a bit like. Uh, some people refusing to believe the war is over, you know, that it's still going. So therefore, we've still got to be very USSR, even though it's gone. All right, so we've got a 10, we've got an 8, we've got a 6 and a 5. Yeah. Okay, well, you know, across the board scores. Not, not awful, though. I thought Samir was going to go a lot worse than 5. I, I thought you were as well. Mm. But I get, I get what you're well, saying when it comes to action in the Brosnan era action sort of became more of what the series was about more than spy thriller. I think, as you say, they threw everything but the kitchen sink at it. And as I say, I think actually, you know, even I can admit this, in the Brosnan era, they were trying to work out where the series can have its footing now. I fully, I think that's fair yes. enough. Um, fair observation. I think Goldeneye, if I'm fine, I think it's the la is the only, if you will, spy thriller 
of Brosnan's era. Tomorrow Never Dies Well Enough and Dying Day are certainly not spy thrillers. Okay, all right. Well, um, Henry, is there anything more you want to add? Anything more you Just want to talk about? Today? Pleasure being here again. Thank you for having me. It's always great to talk about this film, this particular film, more than others. All right, well, thanks to Henry for coming back on. It's always a pleasure to have him on and his enthusiasm on Bond related subjects, you know, because um, some of us here are not too enthusiastic about Bond, so it's quite nice to get that opposite side of things. Um, right, well, what's left to say? 10% uh, discount on SIS training gear stuff. Uh, I'll put the link in the description so you can go and help them out. We don't get anything for that, but you can help them out. Um, follow us on social media on Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram, and just about everything you can think of. And you can find our videos all over the place. Uh, we're on Facebook and BitChute and all these other obscure websites that you may or may not have ever heard of. I think that's about it from me. Yeah, I think we're done on this one. So, goodbye from me. Goodbye from me. Goodbye from me. Ta-ra. <laughs>